Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Evidence-Based Practice. This is Lecture D. The component, Evidence-Based Medicine, is a survey of how healthcare and public health are organized and services delivered in the U.S. By the end of this unit, Evidence-Based Practice, students will be able to Define the key tenets of evidence-based medicine, EBM, and its role in the culture of healthcare. Construct answerable clinical questions and critically appraise evidence answering them. Apply EBM for intervention studies, including the phrasing of answerable questions, finding evidence to answer them, and applying them to given clinical situations. Understand EBM applied to the other key clinical questions of diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. Discuss the benefits and limitations to summarizing evidence. Describe how to implement EBM in clinical settings through clinical practice guidelines and decision analysis. This lecture will discuss diagnosis, particularly the effectiveness of diagnostic tests. How can we use evidence-based medicine to assess questions about diagnosis? If we look at the diagnosis process, the process of evaluating a patient and coming up with a diagnosis, we see that the process involves both logical reasoning and pattern recognition. Logical reasoning is the ability to put together different symptoms to rule things in or out based on their frequency. Pattern recognition is the ability to look at the patterns that we commonly see in various diseases. The diagnostic process actually has two essential steps. Before we can begin talking about diagnostic tests, we have to enumerate all the diagnostic possibilities and estimate their likelihood. Diagnostic decision support systems generate a differential diagnosis, not only of the possibilities, but of the likelihood of each possibility. The second step is to incorporate new information from diagnostic tests that affect the probabilities for different items of the differential diagnosis. We can then rule out some possibilities and choose the most likely diagnosis. In this lecture, we will also discuss two variants on diagnosis. One is screening, which is the use of diagnostic tests to screen people who are healthy in an attempt to intervene early to alter the disease process. Another is clinical prediction rules, where many pieces of information, including diagnostic tests, are used to try to predict the presence or absence of a disease. When we talk about diagnosis, we usually talk about the certainty or perhaps the uncertainty of the diagnosis. We typically express certainty or uncertainty as a mathematical probability, which can sometimes seem daunting, particularly to those who have not been exposed to probability or diagnostic decision-making. When we talk about probabilities, we talk about them on a scale from zero to one which corresponds to the scale of 0% to 100%. For example, when we flip a coin, the probability of getting heads is 0.5 or 50%. The same is true for the probability of getting tails, if it is a fair coin. An alternative expression of probabilities is to talk about the odds. The odds are the probability of an event occurring versus the probability of an event not occurring. Or the ratio. The odds of getting heads on a coin flip is 1 to 1. 1 is another way to say it. When we roll a single die with six possibilities on the sides of the die, the probability of getting any number is 1 6. The odds of getting any one number are 1 to 5. Another principle to consider when talking about probability is that the sum of all probabilities should equal 1. For example, with a coin flip, the probability of head or tails is each 0.5, which adds up to 1. When we calculate the probability of a disease with information from a diagnostic test, we use Bayes' theorem, which is a statistical formula that gives us the post-test probability, sometimes called the posterior probability. It gives us the post-test probability of, in this case, a disease being present. Bayes' theorem is also used for things other than medical diagnosis, 
The post-test probability is a function of both the pretest probability and the results of the test. Bayes' theorem tells us that it is important to know what the prior or pretest probability is, as that information is used to calculate a new probability when test results are added. Also related to diagnostic testing is this figure that comes from Guyot's Evidence-Based Medicine textbook. This figure shows that there is anywhere from a 0 to 100% chance that a patient has a disease. Although we typically do not quantify this in routine medical practice, there is actually a threshold where we decide to test the patient for a disease and a threshold at which we decide to treat them. Below the test threshold, we think the disease is so unlikely or perhaps so unimportant that no testing is warranted. At some point, we reach the threshold where we say, we should really get a test to see if the patient has this disease. So our probability estimate tells us that further testing is required when we exceed the test threshold. Eventually we reach a point, and it may not be 100%, where we are highly certain that the disease is present, so we go ahead and treat the patient. We cross over the treatment threshold because the probability that they have the disease is so high that it leads us to do that. This is different for different diseases, and the treatment threshold depends on both the benefit and the risk of the treatment. If the treatment for a serious disease has high benefit and relatively low risk, the treatment threshold may actually be lower than if it is a treatment that potentially has a lot of adverse effects. Screening is related to diagnosis, but is not quite the same. Screening is the identification of unrecognized disease. What we hope to do with screening is recognize disease so we can intervene at an earlier stage. We may aim to keep the disease or its complications from occurring, sometimes called primary prevention. Or we may want to prevent complications from developing when the disease has already happened, sometimes called secondary prevention. What are the attributes of a good screening test? It should have a low cost because we typically apply screening to large numbers of people. A good screening test has to lead to an effective intervention, ideally documented by a randomized controlled trial of the screening intervention. Finally, the test should be of high sensitivity. That is because we do not want to miss any cases, for example, have any false negative cases. This is usually followed up with a test of high specificity to make sure the test is not a false positive. Americans love screening tests despite the fact that there's a lack of evidence for many of them. They are willing to have these tests done despite many medical professionals knowing that the tests themselves may not be completely accurate or that there may not be a good treatment for a screen disease if detected early. A key problem with screening tests is that the cost of false positive tests is substantial. There was one study that looked at screening for four types of cancer that is commonly done, prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian cancer. This study found that 43% of people screened had at least one false positive test within their screening. That false positive test led to increased medical spending in the following year by over $1,000. In recent years, there have been major public controversies over screening tests. In 2009, a review of the evidence called into question the value of mammography screening for breast cancer in women under 50, raising concern that for this population, the screening test caused more harm than benefit. In 2011, a similar situation occurred for prostate cancer screening with prostate-specific antigen, or PSA, raising questions about whether the excess surgery and its complications in those with disease never destined to spread beyond the prostate outweighed the benefits of those with disease likely to be fatal. The references on this slide point to both scientific analyses as well as well-written articles about the controversies in the New York Times. We will finish this lecture with some discussion about clinical prediction rules.
We are not going to go into great detail on these, but certainly many of you who are regular readers of the medical literature have probably seen papers where they are used. The idea behind clinical prediction rules is that we use results from multiple tests in quotes here because the information used in clinical prediction rules is not only things like blood tests and x-rays, but also the presence of certain clinical findings, signs, and symptoms. All of these different pieces of data are used to predict the diagnosis. There are rules for critically appraising clinical prediction rule studies, and in essence, the best evidence for clinical prediction rules will establish the rule in one population and then validate it in another independent one. For example, Something that is very important clinically because there are no diagnostic tests that are absolutely definitive is the prediction of deep venous thrombosis, or DVT, a blood clot in the deep veins of the lower extremities, which as all clinicians know, puts the patient at risk for the clot breaking off and causing pulmonary embolism, which can be serious, if not fatal. Unfortunately, there are no tests that are both highly sensitive and specific for DVT. And so it is helpful to try to develop clinical prediction rules that give us confidence in the diagnosis or ruling out the diagnosis when we are seeing a patient who might have this condition. The prediction rule for deep venous thrombosis that Wells and colleagues have developed has high sensitivity but moderate specificity. This is probably helpful because having high sensitivity is good at ruling out disease, more so than ruling it in. And with something as serious as DVT that can predispose to pulmonary embolism, it is probably more important to be confident that we ruled out the disease rather than ruled it in. There are many other areas where clinical prediction rules have been applied. One recent study looked at predicting coronary artery disease by looking at all the different so-called markers that had been proposed for coronary artery disease in recent years. Interestingly, this study found that none of these newer risk markers add more to known basic risk factors, such as cholesterol, family history, hypertension, and diabetes. The techniques of clinical prediction rules can be used to evaluate new markers for disease as they are developed. This concludes Lecture D of Evidence-Based Practice. In summary, another type of question for which we seek evidence is diagnosis. The process of diagnosis involves logical reasoning and pattern recognition. It consists of two essential steps, generating a differential diagnosis, and then incorporating new information from diagnostic tests to choose the most likely diagnosis.